So today we're going to talk about four core concepts that I think are going to be crucial to your understanding of Kuo AI and other technologies as you dive deeper and deeper into tech, AI, or pretty much anything software related. So the four things we're going to go over, we're going to start with something simple and progressively we'll get into more complex topics. But first we'll start out with something easy like the command line interface, then we'll talk about object oriented programming, and also we're going to go ahead and talk about API just to be clear on what we're referring to when we say that. And last, just for mainly for those of you that are thinking about using Crew AI or other AI products to build a business, a SaaS product, we're going to talk about integrations. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Let's get right to it. So command line interface. Since we started building out these projects, I'm sure if you follow on the first tutorial, we started doing all these installs on your terminal, right? Remember, pip install this, pip x, get this, get that. So all of those were just simply command line interface commands. Now, depending on the software that you installed on your computer, you were able to access some of these commands. Remember, you had to install pip before you could do pip commands. You had to install Python before you could do Python commands. And of course, like any computer that you have, there are some commands that you can just natively run depending on whether you're on Mac or on Windows. But that's basically it, command line interface, depending on the software you have, you have access to different commands that do different things. And again, that's just pretty much the quickest way to start doing something with that particular software once you install it on your computer. Now, one more thing about the command line interface and the commands don't try to memorize all of these. You're only ever going to use them depending on what technologies you are using. Now, it is more useful if you memorize them, but again, don't break your head. And those two out whenever you see somebody typing them out on a YouTube video and you feel like they know everything. They probably just don't know a lot of times. I kind of feel that way with a lot of these career projects. But again, don't get stressed by it. If you forget one, just look it up, Google it, ask ChatGPT, no shame in that. So, next thing we're going to talk about is object oriented programming in the context of Crew AI and how that's going to help you understand Python specifically for these projects better down the line. So before I got into tech, before I ever wrote a single line of code, I always kept hearing this thing, object-oriented programming, and I could not for the life of me understand or even try to assume what it meant. Because objects, I mean, everything's an object, right? So what does that have to do with programming? I don't know, it was very confusing, it was frustrating, I probably didn't care about the time, but to some extent, it always bothered me a little. So when we talk about objects, or rather object-oriented programming in the context of both Python and Crew AI, we're gonna go over this code snippet real quick, and I'm just gonna walk you through it and as simple as I can, and you're gonna to start to see the relation not only between Crew AI and Python, but also how this ties in with other programming languages, because a lot of them are object-oriented programming languages. So taking a closer look at this snippet of code, right, it might not be entirely obvious right off the bat to know what's going on, but even if you're not a programmer, you start reading through some of these words, you see this Crew AI, you see agent task. I mean, you don't really know why that's there or whatever, but you know, to some extent, you can kind of start to deduce that this is related to Crew AI. And then you see some familiar words here. You see task, okay. You see something about an agent here, okay. But how do you even begin to read this? You know, it's in Python because it doesn't look too complicated, but at the same time, it's still kind of just you know jargon to some extent. So I'll tell you how you can read this. Usually for a lot of programming files, if you're starting on the main file, you're gonna start somewhere closer to the end. It's not typical like just reading a book that you start from top to bottom. Sure, over time, you'll develop this skill to just kind of skim over it and get a better idea of what's going on. But at the beginning, if you're looking at something like the main file, it's gonna be a little bit easier if you start at the end and just kind of trace your way back. Now this doesn't apply to anything, I'm just giving you an example for this particular case, so don't don't quote me on that, don't always go to the end of the file. But like I said, we're going over this example, and over time you're going to develop the skill to just be able to read through these a little bit easier. And now with AI technology, ChatGPT, Cloud, whatever AI you want to use, you basically have a 24-7 tutor that can explain things to you line by line. So you'll be able to learn as quickly as possible, quicker than anybody else in history, because remember, Back then, a lot of people had to learn programming through books or YouTube videos. So let's look at this last line, right? We see this marketing underscore agent, assign task, parentheses, marketing task. So we know there's something related to some marketing agent, but what is this thing, right? What is marketing agent? Marketing underscore agent. Well, here in the comments that were left here, we can see that it was, that what's going on in this line is basically assigning a task to our marketing agent. So this is our marketing agent, but in Python, how do we know what a marketing agent is? Like, how is that written out, described, how is that decided? We just do a control find, just to highlight for clarity, let's put marketing agent. You see here at the top that says marketing underscore agent is equal to agent, and then you have parentheses, and then you have a couple of other things in these parentheses. Okay, that's interesting. So we know 
whatever agent is talking about down here, it's being created or defined and initiated here at the top. And what a marketing agent is, that is this marketing agent variable, it's just an agent object. And this agent object is gonna have the attributes role and goal defined in here. So just looking at this agent object definition, and again, that's where you start hearing the word object a little more. We know that this agent has a role that makes it up, it has a goal, and for the role attribute inside this agent, the value is set to marketing analyst. Okay, that's interesting. So now we read this at the bottom again, we know that this marketing agent was initiated up here, and we know that what this marketing agent variable is, is just an agent object, and for this particular agent object, it has a role. So after marketing underscore agent, we know that it's calling a method called assign task. I'm not gonna get too much into methods, but that's what this dot implies implies that after this object is called there's a method being called and what does that method do okay well same thing let's look it up just here within our file so when we control find for assign task we don't see anything else related to assign task now why is that if we can't see in this file where do we know how do we know what assign task is what it even does well remember marketing agent is an agent object which we can see that is created here. Now, there's a lot more depth that goes into how an agent is created, what an agent does in the background, and a lot of that information isn't also in this file. So why is this still, why does this still make sense? Well, if you look at the first line here from Crew AI import agent task, what this line here at the top does is basically what it says here, it's importing the agent and task class from the Crew AI library. And all that means is that any information, any code related to the agent files, the task files, or rather the agent classes, task classes, is accessible within this file here that's being written out because we imported it. So even though we can't explicitly see what a sign task is, we are able to access this method because of this import. Now, I know it still leaves a little bit of explaining to do as far as what sign task actually does, but again, we just want to get a quick overview at how this code is working. And then we see in here within the assign task method, we have a marketing test. So what is a marketing test? Well, let's follow the same pattern. We scroll a little bit higher. We set marketing task is set to equal a task object. Now this task object is being given certain values for the attributes description and expected output. That is, the task object has, that is, what makes up a task object is multiple attributes. One of those attributes is description. And for this marketing task, task object, we're setting the description to be this value right here, just review the effectiveness of the latest marketing campaign. And also for the expected output attribute of this task object, we're getting summary of the campaign performance. So again, same thing, this marketing task is simply a variable used to create an object or to instantiate an object of the class task. So now with that code explanation, which I admit was probably a little bit long, you can start reading this line, marketing agent, assign task, marketing task, and you see here that the marketing agent is just a marketing agent object, which is created up here. And now you can see that assign task is a method, which we don't get any information on, but now we know that the reason why it's not there on the file is because of this query I import that was done at the beginning. And you see that the marketing task parameter that is used by this assign task, so methods typically have parameters and all parameter is, is basically what a method takes in in order to do its job. We can see that this marketing task is instantiated or created in this part and this is where its attributes or rather basically the details of that object are defined or that the values are set for. So that's just a very quick overview of object-oriented programming in the context of Python as well as Crew AI project. And this pattern of calling something, creating it, in defining it is something that you're going to see in other programming languages such as Java, Kotlin, or pretty much any programming language that's popular. So hopefully you're starting to see a pattern now that people that become technologically savvy or talented or whatnot, well all it is is they become proficient at what they do and doing it in different ways because to some extent there's a lot of similarities in the methodologies that are applied. Now I emphasize these points because I know there's a lot of people that are entry level, beginners, are not so familiar with technology that are watching my videos and I never want to say anything or showcase anything that might be discouraging or make it seem like you know I know a lot more than anybody else. I think if you're watching this stuff you're probably really interested in technology, you're probably really interested in AI and just because you haven't built up a background in it 
doesn't mean it's too late to start now. If anything, I think because of all these amazing AI tools that are going to help you learn faster, it's going to be the perfect time for you to quickly level up and quickly start applying the skills to making things, creating projects, basically doing whatever you want with technology. So next thing we're going to talk about is going to be APIs or application programming interface. Now we've been using this keyword a lot, rather we've been talking about API keys a lot, but what is what does that mean, right? API, what are you talking about? Why do you need keys? So we're going to start break, the, break this down very very simple, very quickly. This example is really just, and we're not going to go over this, it's really to show you how API calls are made typically, but the beautiful thing about Crew AI is that it really kind of takes care of that for you, and it only asks you for the API key. So what is an API? An application programming interface. First, let's focus on this word, interface. Interface, think of the word interact. And an example of an interface, think about your computer keyboard right now. When you type in your keyboard, whether you're going to a website, writing an email, working on a career project, the keyboard allows you to interact with your computer. And one of the amazing things about an interface is that you don't necessarily have to understand how the computer works. You don't have to know the ins and outs of a computer, of the operating system, about how memory works, about any of that stuff. You just know that the keyboard gives you access to your PC. So that's kind of what we mean when we say interface, right? Just think of it as something that lets you interact with something else without you having to worry about the complexity of it or rather what's going on behind the scene. So we think about a programming interface. What were we talking about previously? We're talking about the command line interface and there's that word again, interface. Something that lets you interact with something else. In that case, we're talking about the command line. So that box, that terminal, that's what lets you interact with your computer when you give it commands, right? That command line interface. So in terms of an application programming interface, really talking about something that lets you interact with an application or with other applications for programming. But again, I want to keep emphasizing the interface or interaction part of this whole thing. So when companies, startups, developers create applications, they also create an API. I'm sure you've heard of this, that, you know, this this company just released their API or they're announcing their API, blah, blah. And maybe you're thinking, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? They made this application. So why did they have to create an application programming interface for an application that they own? Well, the point of the application programming interface is to let other people use some of the services or rather some of the features that their application offers, but without giving them too much information about how the application works or really what it does. Think back to our keyboard example. You can use the keyboard to use your MacBook, but the keyboard doesn't inherently reveal any other information about the computer. So even though you have access to your MacBook and even though you can use it to do pretty much whatever you want with it, the keyboard itself or the interface itself is made just for you to be able to use the thing. It's not made to reveal anything else about the thing. Same thing with an API or the application programming interface. You're going to be able to interact with somebody else's application or product through that interface that they're providing for you so that you can program for your application with their application. And that's kind of where API keys come in, right? If you're going to be given that privilege of being able to use somebody else's application or service, you kind of have to have a way to access it in a manner that you're also able to be, I guess, to some extent, be held accountable or something that can link the things that you do with the API to your account. So I guess just in case you start doing things that you're not supposed to, then, I mean, it's going to be pretty easy to find out who's doing it or, you know, all that stuff. So that's why you see for a lot of these create tutorials that people are making or that I put on there, you tend to need a different API key for depending on the LLM that you're using, depending on the tool that you're using, even if it's something to scrape the web, search the web, because somebody else built this application and they've pretty much agreed to let you use it. But in order to monitor the activity or in order to make sure that it's being used correctly, the privilege is being delegated to you through a key. And again, in order to even start making these requests, you have to have your API key. And a lot of these details that you see right here is one of the great things I mentioned earlier about Core AI. For Core AI, in order to use API, you don't need anything else but an API key because the people that have been working on Core AI in order to make it better, easier for people to use, have taken care of the logic that goes on behind the scenes whenever you use the API of these LLMs like opening to make that request to use it for Core AI. So yeah, I think it's pretty amazing that all you need is the API key in terms of simplicity and user friendliness. So last thing we're gonna talk about is integrations. Now I'm sure you've heard this word before. I'm sure it gets thrown around a lot, especially now in the current landscape of AI, all these tools that are working together, this and that. But I wanna make it very simple for you to understand at the core what an integration is. While you should be familiar with this concept and why it's important for you to become more and more aware of integrations as you develop your 
create AI projects, as you develop your MVP for your application that you're working on, and as you start working with other developers, other teams. So all an integration is, is combining what one tool does with what another tool does. So a quick example of that, some of the requests that I've gotten or that I've helped people with are related to getting the career results to save in the database. Again, Career AI doesn't inherently do that. Career AI runs the Career AI projects when you run them. Now, if you want to do anything else without data, well, that's a separate step that has to be taken. And depending on what kind of database you're working with, maybe you're working with MySQL, maybe you're working with Airtable. But in order to get Career AI to work with that database, you would have to integrate Career AI with that database. Now, that's a very straightforward example of an integration. Another example would be, I'm sure you've seen on some of these career projects that you import tools. You can import tools such as the web scraping, you can import tools such as the Google search. Now, in order for those tools to become available within a career AI project, somebody had to go out of their way to write the code so that you could basically just call the tool within the code and be able to use it. Somebody worked to integrate those tools from a different set of developers, from a different company, from a different team, in order to bring it over to a career AI project with ease of use. That's another integration. And an, and an integration can be something even more complex. Maybe you're working or you've been working on an MVP, a product that you've been creating it, and now you want to link it to Career AI so that it can work even better, even faster, get better results. So your app or your specific product that you're working on would have to be integrated with Career AI. That is, find a way in order for it to communicate what that product is doing with Career AI in order for them to work. Too. With the rise of AI technologies, one of the things I've seen is that Mainstream tools such as Zapier or Make have made pretty much anything that's related to AI be tied into an integration. Now, that doesn't mean that integrations are a new thing. Integrations have been happening or rather had to be done even before AI. And if anything, I feel that now with the rise of AI and the rise of all these tools, integrations are becoming more important. But you shouldn't forget that all integration is is two systems communicating with one another. And even before we had all these amazing AI tools, these integrations were typically done through API requests. I know a lot of you are working to create some amazing things with AI technology, with Career AI and other tools. And as you build out these amazing products, ask yourself, what is the thing that you want your application to do that it's currently not doing? And once you start basically writing out that thing, defining it as clear as you can, you can start looking at whether there are libraries, tools, APIs that you could use possibly at a low cost in order to get that feature or that service to work the way you want it. Chances are that that problem you're trying to solve was at some point a smaller problem to a bigger thing that somebody else solved in their application that's probably available through their API that you could probably link up to your project in order to get the same benefits at a much lower cost without having to get any custom development done and without having to implement any expensive or heavy tool. And that's typically a common pattern in the software world that when somebody offers a solution that is paid, another group of people will offer that same solution through open source and at little to no cost. Sometimes it may not be as user friendly, but again, if you're just testing things out, if you just wanna try and figure out how you can fix the thing, how you can make the thing, that's usually the best way to And that's pretty much it for this video, guys. As we've gone more in depth into Career AI, I'm trying my best to make it as user friendly as possible. I try my best to explain this in simple terms and showcase the easiest way that you can do it. But the more we go into this technology, it can be helped that we're going to be using more technical terms. And looking back at some of the obstacles that I had to go through when I was going through my tech journey, I couldn't help but think that this is some clarification that I wish I had had very early on in my career so that I could more easily tackle projects that at the time seemed very daunting and instead face these challenges with a little bit more confidence. I love hearing about all the stuff that you guys are working on with Crew AI. So if you have a project in mind that you want to share, make sure you leave it in the comments. And again, in the description, I do have a link for my Calendly if you want to book a one-on-one -on -one free of charge for consulting or for questions you may have about Crew AI or a product that you're building out. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next one.